responsive reading printed in your bulletin. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together. This morning, it's my privilege to welcome to the pulpit Jack Kimmel, it's the composer of this morning's first music, Sunday Morning. Jack is joined in as, by the lyricist Adrian Sweats, who with his wife Kathy joined the church in 1958. And I know that Kathy this morning adds to our experience of worship by offering the flowers that we see here on the dais. Won't you please welcome Jack Kimmel as he provides us an introduction to this piece of music as a part of our gathering. I'll try to get through this. Good morning. My name is Jack Normain Kimball and I was asked to say some words about myself my relationship with the church and Sunday morning, which is being performed today. I have a PhD in composition from Michigan State University, so my life has been mostly involved with music. While studying for my degree back in the 60s, I was first introduced to Fountain Street by Kathy and Adrian Sweats as a place to, I quote, free the mind, grow the soul, and change the world. It was also then I became friends with Duncan Littlefair, and choir director Beverly Howerton. Since then, my wife Mary and I became a devoted Fountain Streeters while living away or visiting Grand Rapids. Through the years following the suggestion of Duncan and Beverly, I have written quite a number of choral compositions for Fountain Street with Adrian's lyrics, including a commissioned oratorial, Magic at the Heart of the Universe. I've also written for the church Christmas music for two pianos, music for brass and reed instruments, and was commissioned to write a work, Exaltation, for organ and chorus to celebrate the new Fountain Street pipe organ in 2003. Some of the lyrics I have used in my music were written by me or from taken from sermons of Duncan Little Fair. The oratorial or sections of such as Winter Comes have often been performed here, and the entire work was published by Shawnee Press. After some research, I found that today's Sunday morning was composed November 17, 1971, while I was living in New York City. It seems its first performance with choir director Beverly Howerton was February 27, 1972, and has been performed other times since. In Sunday morning, Adrian's lyric tried to state the feeling philosophy of this special church, companionship, recognition of others, and perhaps some purpose of prayer. While setting the words to music, I had in mind a sort of gospel and rock feeling and rhythm. The song for me was, has a feeling of warmth and caring, sometimes pensive, then rhythmic, a feeling of home away and faces of friendly people who think beyond the norm. Other than that, Sunday morning will speak for itself. I'd like to thank the choir and the directors for its performance today. which I dedicate to my wonderful life, Mary, who has suffered a stroke at the beginning of February. I'd like to thank those of you who have called, sent cards, and come to visit Mary. Thank you very much.
Once a year, it is our custom to read aloud the names of those in our community who have died since the last Memorial Day. As we enter into that time of remembrance and honor, I recall to you that in the Jewish tradition, every week there are a prayer called the Kaddish is repeated five times. It is how the service begins. It segments each section of the service. And the service cannot end until the last one is recited. By custom, that last one is recited by those in mourning so that those who have lost the most are the ones who bestow the last blessing before the end of the service. It may seem ironic to you, but in some sense it is the most fitting. For those who have lost the most know very much what life is worth. And to be able to bestow a blessing of hope upon others, to lead us into the next day, is an honor that grief, grief alone, may hold. And so we crave that in reciting these names, we are blessed. We are blessed by not only their presence in the past, but their presence in our hearts and minds today. After a decade of serving you, I know these names as more than names. And I lift up with honor and treasure and sorrow those who tread our way with us sometimes for many years, and whose voices and faces and hearts still beat among us in honored memory and gratitude. We lift up in memory and honor Jane Branston, Teresa Buist, Marilyn Charnetsky, Mary Ellen Garbrecht, Samuel H. Greenewald, Jr., Victoria Johnson Hoffius, Janet Matheson Jones, Donald McClung Cranenberg, Sr. Anne Gerth Logan. Dr. John McKeegan. Roger Allen Matthews. Edith Edie McCarver. Joan Evenson Newbury, Louise Philippi, Dr. Richard A. Rasmussen, Wendy Lou Reed, Diane Rogers. Helen Hutchins Rosano, David Shaw, Robert Bob, Edward Smith, Kelly Hazeman Smith, John L. Jack Wheezy, M.D. Theodore C. Williams, Mitch Witkowski, David C. Wittenbach, born of the sun, they traveled a short while toward the sun and left the vivid air signed with their honor.
When the day of Pentecost had come, it says in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans, and how is it that we hear each in our own native language? Malcolm X, a gifted orator of his own, reminds us, I'm thinking of his birthday, which was last week, there is no better than adversity. Every defeat, every heartbreak, every loss contains its own seed, its own lesson on how to improve your performance next time. Stumbling is not falling. To which I would add famous words from J.R.R. Tolkien, not all who wander are lost. Layers. Holidays and rituals often have many layers. We read the names of our dead on Memorial Day. We do it with great feeling layered over by years of experience. Our ritual itself built upon the national observance of Memorial Day this weekend. Our tower room where you ought to pause on your way through was the original Kent County Memorial to those who fell in World War I. That ritual commemorating those who lost their lives in war sits atop an older layer, something called Decoration Day. Some of us are old enough to remember people talking about Decoration Day, which applied specifically to the Civil War. There are several stories as to where the holiday came from, widows in the South preserving the honor of their fallen sons and fallen husbands, or the widows and mothers of the North doing the same. History attributes it to a a Union colonel who suggested doing so in 1868 at Arlington Cemetery. But on top of that, that that layer sits on top of another that's often forgotten, that in May of 1865 in the city of Charleston, South Carolina, recently liberated, for lack of a better word, from its Confederate soldiers by a troop of black Union troops including members of the 54th Massachusetts, that which fought at Fort Pillow and other places. That on May 1st, the black population, which now outnumbered the white, the whites having fled, came to the mass burial of 200 Union soldiers and laid flowers upon their graves on May of 1865. I didn't know that, did you? Layers upon layers. Almost any ritual or holiday will have layers upon which it rests, layers that go beneath the surface of our obvious awareness. This weekend, as you know, is the feast of Christian feast of Pentecost, which celebrates the moment, as you heard, when the Holy Spirit came to the followers of Jesus. The miracle, by the way, is not that they spoke in angelic tongues the way modern Pentecostals did, but they spoke in other tongues that others could hear so that the gospel could reach the world. But the word Pentecost is really a very simple word. It means the word 50, 5, 0. It it bespeaks in Greek the Jewish holiday called Shavuot, which means weeks, meaning seven weeks, seven times seven being, remember, 49. And the day after that is the 50th day, which designates the beginning of a solemn, I shouldn't say solemn, a joyful observance in Judaism when you bring your first fruits to the temple in Jerusalem. But that rests on top of another holiday, which consists of remembering the giving of the law on Mount Sinai in which Jews celebrate that they were the beneficiary of this gift of a relationship with Jehovah Yahweh, God, and formed a covenant 
with that God that made them who they were. And of course, that's the point I want to go to is that covenant because what gets overlooked by Christians because they don't know this, Christ, this Jewish stuff is that the miracle of Christian Pentecost is a reiteration of the Jewish Pentecostal moment when God and humans came close together and one related to the other. And so the Christian message of Pentecost is not the miracle of the tongues, it is the new law and the new covenant that was promised by the ministry of Jesus. That's your lesson for today. I'm obliged to teach from time to time. But what's important here is that festival of first fruits is one of three pilgrim festivals. In ancient Israel, the men particularly were summoned to the temple from all the corners of the land three times a year. That was one of them. And they always had to bring a sacrifice, something to give. They had to make a pilgrim journey to the temple. In some ways, the liberal church is the pilgrim church. And I don't mean pilgrims with buckles and hats. I mean pilgrim in the sense of those that are on the move, that are on their way, that are going somewhere. Our nine-word nine recollection of what liberal religion is to free the mind, grow the soul, change the world is not what we have done, but what we seek to do. We are on our way. That is our pilgrim journey of faith what we do, our spiritual discipline par excellence, our practice par excellence is pilgrimage, going from here to there. I just completed a personal pilgrimage. I am grateful to our governing board that they supported my taking a three-week trip to China, as I did last year to Japan. A distance, well, let me put it this way, it's literally the other side of the world. It's exactly 12 time zones away. One of four journeys I have made in the last several years along a, an ancient Roman road in England, part of the Camino to Santiago in Spain, last year in Japan and now to China. Those, those previous ones were actually really long hikes day after day, 5, 10, 15 miles a day. I didn't do that this time, partly because China is not very fond of people wandering around alone. Let's just say they like people to travel in groups. But the point of this is that no matter how I did it, I was on a path somewhere. Paths in some ways are like inverse layers. They wear down what is obvious, but they are tread over and over by other people so that wherever you are, someone else has been there before, walking that path ahead of you, and that's part of the power of a pilgrimage. You're not the first, you're not the last. You're sharing across space and time a journey others have shared. Beneath the surface of the path lies more than the eye can see. I went to places that I will tell you more about in the future an elaborate Tibetan lamasery in the city of Beijing, a mountain climbed by emperors for 2,000 years to pay homage to the Taoist gods, the grave of Kung Fu Ji, otherwise known as Confucius, who probably had more effect on China even than Mao Zedong, the great mosque of Xi'an, where the first Muslim communities set up in the western capital and still are there. That mosque was created in the year 742, not even a century after the death of Muhammad. I visited the caves, the, Dazu, the caves of Dazu in Sichuan, filled with thousands of Buddhist carvings, all meant to instruct those who couldn't read. At some, I lit incense and bowed in reverence. At others, I simply marveled at the immensity and antiquity. And all of these sites were separated by hundreds of miles requiring long train trips and one airplane flight and even one boat ride to reach them all. And of course, there are dozens of other places I could have gone. There are Buddhist cliff carvings all over China, many of them more than worth the effort. The Pokata Palace in Tibet, where the lamas of antiquity used to live, is also now part of China. 
There, is, there are five holy Taoist mountains in China. I only climbed one. There are four left over. And I was, as I said, as far from Grand Rapids as one could get. Twelve hours ahead. Right now, it's almost tomorrow there. And I was in cities I've never heard of, larger than any of the cities in the United States. Chongqing, a city of 30 million people, larger than any city in the United States. And when was the last time you even thought of the city of Chongqing? It looks a lot like Pittsburgh, only way bigger. So this was not a formal pilgrimage, like walking on the paths of the Camino de Santiago, nor was it along a well-trod path itself. But it was to sites and places, ancient, old, and distant, that were to take me away from what I knew most, park me in a place I had never been, because the most important part about the pilgrimage is that you are leaving home. The journey is as much a part of the pilgrimage as the destination. Sometimes in weddings, I liken uh, marriage to a journey, and I cite Constantine Gavafi's wonderful poem, Ithaca. Some of you may know it. Here's a verse from it. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for, but do not hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So old, so you are old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with what you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Pilgrimage is enriched by taking away. We leave home, leave people, leave the things we treasure and rely upon. We live with much less rather than more. And it's hard in this world that values wealth and accumulation to think of being enriched by giving up. But that's what the pilgrimage teaches. In my case, I lived literally by what I could carry. That meant clothes I had to launder from time to time in a variety of sinks. I was limited to one pair of shoes, which were only too glad to be off my feet every day. I haven't put them on since I've returned. A camera that I lost on the very first day, which is the best time to lose a camera, I assure you. And my iPad and my iPhone, which along with my passport and wallet were the only true essentials I carried. My days were also reduced from a to-do list that never gets shorter, ever, to one task, go there. Being reduced to essentials is what a pilgrimage is about. It's what retreats are about and spiritual practices are in general. It is to shed the accumulations of life, the, the flotsam and jetsam, the dust, the, the stuff, and do what matters most. That's why we find these practices appealing. They help us actually be in tune with what matters. Because we know, we really do know that material abundance is not spiritual abundance. We all know that. We are only too happy to say that. We all love the movie Citizen Kane because there is poor Citizen Kane dying, thinking not of his wealth or his power, but of his boyhood sled and his lost childhood. The appeal of meditation and retreats and rituals lies in this paradox that what we own actually owns us and what we want is not what we own but something else. But it also illustrates the reluctance we have to make the tough choice. If we know that stuff is not what makes us happy, if we know that money is not what makes us important, if we know that material abundance is not spiritual abundance, why are we not all monks? Because a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. We've heard that spiritual abundance is better, but geez, if I give it all up, what if I'm wrong? And then I'll just be a poor person on the street, and there's nothing pleasant in that at all. We know that 
material abundance is not happiness, but we also know that if happiness means giving it all up, if we give it all up, will we be happy? I'm not sure. We are reluctant. We are ambivalent. We struggle with what we know to be true, but find difficult to do. We need a push, a good push. My sermon title this morning is by one of the oldest female hip-hop groups still working, Salt and Pepper. That's their song, Push It Real Good. Yes, it's a double entendre. That's what hip-hop does. We all know that. All of its lyrics are meant to make you think a naughty thought, and they're good at that. But they also mean to think, get you to think beyond the naughty thought. Like their other great hit, Let's Talk About Sex. They mean to talk about sex, about you and me, about all the good things and the bad things that could be. They really mean in that song, as in others, to look beyond the obvious to the consequences of choices. We need a push to choose spiritual abundance because choosing spiritual abundance over material abundance, like choosing integrity over instant pleasure, is hard. In a world that celebrates pleasure and power, it is a risk. We need something to push us toward what we know is the better path. We need someone to go first, someone to prove that it's worth doing. In other words, we don't just need a push, we need to be pulled along. While some endeavors need leaders that push us along, bosses who tell us, do this and do that, and meet that deadline, other endeavors, spiritual endeavors, need leaders who pull us along. When I think of spiritual leaders, when you think of spiritual leaders, who come to mind? Martin Luther King, Mahatmas Gandhi, Oscar Romero. These are not people who told us what to do. They went and did it themselves, subtly asking us why we were not. Spiritual leaders push themselves, not others. But in pushing themselves, they pull others to follow them. Of course, there's no guarantee that others will follow. And of course, the three men I just mentioned, well, let's just say their lives ended in not in a way that even they wanted. They all died at the hands of those frightened by their integrity. I guess we should be careful before we take up the spiritual path. It might lead us off a cliff after all. But when we think of great spiritual exemplars, it is those who live with deep integrity that inspire us the most, not those who had the greatest acclaim or the highest success or the most worldly power. We know that personal courage is the ultimate spiritual value, for every other spiritual value depends on it. If you do not have the nerve to do what must be done, shut up about anyone else until you've done it yourself which means I have to get to the hard part myself. Okay, if I'm going to stand here, i got to be courageous from time to time. And while I do admit that the pilgrim journey is one way of modeling that behavior, sometimes you have to grab the pulpit and say things that you've been reluctant to say. Now, don't get worried. This is not about you. Okay? Relax. But I am going to push you, or perhaps pull you, closer to your spiritual path. While I was away from home, I was able to sneak around the Great Firewall, as they call it periodically, on the internet, but not much. But what I did learn was my hometown, where I grew up, the town of Baltimore, became a new and refreshed symbol of our struggle, 400 years worth of struggle with race in America. I lived there for nine years, the second nine years of my life, and was there in 1968 when violence erupted after King's murder. My best friend in high school was a black student from the poor part of town, and my parents were not entirely happy when I went to visit him at his house. Forty years later, Baltimore is a lot like Detroit, where the whites fled and left a city that is now majority black, majority poor, surrounded by whiter, richer communities that drive very hard not to go through town. 
When Freddie Gray died and the people rose up angrily, violently, the usual liturgy of dismay filled the media, so much so that even Xinhua, that's the Chinese news agency, was only too happy to report on racial violence in America. They do have an English language station, by the way. I have not spoken about this issue very much, which started almost a year ago in Ferguson, Missouri, because it's hard to do that without stirring up a lot of troubling ideas and feelings. And after all, we have plenty on our plate as a church right now, and what could we do that could make a difference? I did my work with the Urban League, that's, that's fine. But then a colleague, while I was away, writing to others, including me, just in general, reminded us that silence is assent. I have a pulpit. Not to speak about this from here is to be silent, is to fail the test of courage. So here goes. America is a profoundly, deeply, embeddedly racist nation, top to bottom, left to right, front to back, which is not to say you are all bigots or that you have terrible thoughts, but that the nature of our society is premised upon black inferiority and white superiority so deeply, so profoundly, so thoroughly that it is in both of our constitutions, the one that is written and the one that we call our culture. We who are white often don't notice this because the burdens don't fall upon us. It's commonly called white privilege and whenever I mention white privilege people say, hey, I, I don't have white privilege, I'm just a person. But if you're white, you enjoy advantages that other people do not. You don't notice them because, hey, you're white. Second is, chances are, unless you have 30 or 40 black friends, you're not hearing stories about those who don't get that. Some of you may have go to Chicago from time to time or may have one of those little transponders in your car that lets you go through toll booths rapidly. Back in the East, they're called Easy Pass, I Pass. You know what it is? If you're white, you get an Easy Pass transponder through life. You don't have to wait in the same lines. You don't have to cough up the same amount of work. To be white is a gift we didn't earn. We are not entitled to it. And sometimes we're so blind to it that we think everybody else has them. And so when people of color tell us that education, housing, health care, employment, and law enforcement treat them differently because they are black, we say, no, of course not. Slavery's over. Jim Crow was ended. Segregation is done for. Yeah, maybe there are discrepancies, but they're just here and there. They're random. They only happen because of individual bigots. It's not systematic. It's not institutional. Really, it's not. We just have to learn how to get along better. That is the lie. We live in a nation where even if we are not bigots and not racists personally, we benefit by a society that is structured to benefit people who are white. And the fact that we don't say something about that as white people, that we don't own it as something that is real, that we do not take black people seriously when they say it is happening, and instead say, you're just being overly sensitive. No, 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 no. This isn't systematic, it's just an individual. When we fail to take that seriously from them, we prove once more that racism is part of who everyone is. Now, we all know that similar arguments are raised against same-sex marriage, that it's just wrong, that it can't be that way because it's, and we all know they're false. We all know that there are people who think that this has to be a Christian America, and we know they're wrong too. So why are we not able to say this about race? Well, maybe we can. But let's be honest, there's some real fear, and if we're white, we feel it, just the way some straight people feel terrified of same-sex marriage. Some Christians feel horrified at the thought that Muslims and Jews actually belong here. The fear is real. Why? Because we're embedded in this system, and the idea that something's wrong with it means there's something wrong with us. No, there's nothing wrong with us. Or we think, if we change it, 
I will lose something. I will lose my job, my benefits, I will lose my station in society, my children will, be not, will not enjoy the same benefits, and so on and so forth. It is time, my friends, for us to acknowledge that we are afraid of what we will lose and admit that perhaps the only thing we'll lose is our sense of superiority, that we are important because we're Americans, who are white, who are straight, who are Christians. Our part in this struggle, as I see it, is to belie those fears by example, to be spiritual leaders by taking up the path of anti-racism, by taking up the path of resistance, by taking on the spiritual challenge of living spiritually, not practically, about race in America. It is time for us, I believe, and you may disagree with me, and you will be wrong. <laughs> it is time for us as a community of faith to find our way of saying black lives matter. To me, not just to you, black lives matter to me. Freddie Gray matters to me. Eric Garner matters to me. Michael Brown matters to me. I don't care if they committed a crime. They should not have died. That's the difference. Now, stop. Stop. Don't applaud me. I haven't done anything yet. I don't know how to do this. I'm white. I have a lot of learning to do. But I didn't know how to take a pilgrimage the first time I showed up with a backpack and a stick and a pair of shoes on my feet, but I started walking. So the first thing I'm going to say is if we're going to do this, we will not wait until we know how. We will just do it. There is no waiting until we get instructions. We will just do it. We will learn by doing, and we will fail, and people will be embarrassed, and we will be angry. And then, the same way I stepped into as much cow flop as there is in England one day, I got up, shook my foot off, and kept walking. And that's what we will do around race in America. We will stumble. We will fall. We will get dirty. We will be angry. We will get confused. It will rain. We will get wet. We will get lost. And we will keep going. But I assure you, through all of it, if you are looking for spiritual abundance in this life, not spiritual confirmation of your abundance, but actual abundance of spirit, this is a path that leads there. You don't have to give up your money. You don't have to put on a hair shirt. You don't have to leave town. You don't have to stop being important at your job. What you have to do is start walking the walk of anti-racism in America. So when your friend at work says, well, I don't know about this Black Lives Matter. Don't all lives matter? Yes, but right now black lives matter more because they matter so little everywhere else. It, we have to be the people on the side of those who are struggling, not monitoring the debate between them. There is no neutral here, friends. There is either being on the side of those who seek justice or on the side of those who delay it. Our pilgrimage as a pilgrim church is never to a temple in the woods or to the top of a mountain to worship a god or to a monastery to take our ease with our spirit. Our pilgrimage, as it's been for a hundred years, is to a dream. It is a dream of a church, of a nation, and a world that truly means liberty and justice for all. Every day we don't take a step in that direction. We have betrayed that dream a little bit. I don't know how to get us there, friends. I don't know what to do. But I think we need to be ready to do something. And I think we need to be ready to stand up and start moving. When people say, forward through the ages. That's our hymn, by the way. Amen and amen.
Our community moved through an extraordinary serendipity with Fred's own journey and his powerful message this morning, and I ask you to take it seriously. Our social action committee gave money for the first time ever to Black Lives Matter. And we have offered them space in our building to come and to gather and to begin the work which terrifies us all. This is the place. How will you choose to be here if not at a Black Lives Matter meeting, but simply with the courage to say it's time to start walking? May it be so, friends. Go in peace. Amen. Oh.